So this will be a walkthrough of section two, the first verbal section of the new Power Prep 1 for the GRE, new as of September, October 2023. So there are 12 questions. You can use the timestamps to skip ahead to whichever question or questions you're interested in, but we'll just go ahead and get started here with number one. And what I want to emphasize about the text completion questions is that we always want to be thinking proactively, looking for the clues in the sentence or sentences and really trying to think of an approximate answer, as I call it, a simplified answer to go in the blank, rather than going in and plugging all of these words in and seeing which fits. Okay, that could be a plan B or plan C if you can't figure anything else out. But anyway, it says here that dramatic literature often blanks the history of a culture in that, so this is going to explain what they said in the beginning, it takes as its subject matter the important events that have shaped and guided the culture. Okay, dramatic literature often does something to the history of the culture in that it takes as its subject matter the important events that have shaped and guided the culture. So. We could say something like replays. What do I mean replays? Well, you can think of replay on like a, you know, a TV broadcast of a sporting event, but it, it sort of re, even rehashes it, you could say. Recapitulates, recapitulates, replay. Well, they both start with re. Uh, that's something. But to recapitulate is sort of to, to offer a summary of or a retelling of. Uh, you often hear the term recapitulation in discussion of uh, certain musical pieces like symphonies. Maybe there is a theme that appears early on and then it gets recapitulated later. But we can uh, look at the other answer choices and say why they're incorrect. To confound something is to, to get it mixed up or to confuse it, to sort of mess it up, to, yeah, to confuse it. Like if you have a confound in an experiment that you're doing, uh, that's a variable that kind of gets in the way of, of, of what you're trying to study. To repudiate is to reject, to strongly reject something. And we're not rejecting the history of the culture. So again, even though that starts with the re, that's not the right meaning in this case. To anticipate is really, is really the opposite of what we want. To anticipate something is to see it ahead of time or to predict it ahead of time. <laughs> predicted ahead of time that's redundant it's to you know to you anticipate it you, you see something coming before it happens in this case no we're talking about history you can't anticipate history because it's already happened and then polarize well if you polarize your um, you know like a speaker could polarize an audience in the sense that half of the people really like them and half of the people really don't or a uh, performer or an artist is polarizing. Some people really like her, some people really don't. Some people really like him, some people really don't. Uh, something like that. So real strong reactions one way or the other and just doesn't make sense here. So number two. So here we've got two blanks. And here I'm going to try to, well, I'm just going to go ahead and hide the words. I eh, can't quite get that to fit. I'm going to hide the words so that we can all, myself included, focus on being proactive and thinking about what should go in these blanks. So given how blank the shortcomings of the standard economic model are in its, so in the economic model's portrayal of human behavior, the failure of many economists to respond to them is astonishing. Okay, so it's astonishing or very surprising that many economists have failed to respond to these shortcomings and so we could say something like uh, this is more than one word but like the glaring nature you know what do I mean by glaring it's just very clear the blatantness and sometimes I'll come up with a word that you know I'm not even sure that that is a word it's not going to be a correct answer but you know it's blatant so we make that into a noun blatantness something like that okay when I say approximate, I mean approximate. We don't have to fuss over trying to get the exact word. Okay, now the next sentence says, they continue to fill the journals with yet more proofs of yet more blank theorems. More proofs. So there's going to be something negative. More proofs of more, um, I'm going to say irrelevant, something like that. 
but others, by contrast, accept the criticisms as a challenge, seeking to expand the basic model to embrace a wider range of things people do. So this gives us some additional uh, evidence to work with or clues to work with. So if others accept the criticisms and try to expand the model to embrace a wider range of things that people do, that means that these um, failing economists, the ones who fail to address the shortcomings, um, they're coming up with theorems that are, we could just say, really narrow. They're irrelevant in the sense that they're not wide enough to embrace things that people actually do. They are, uh, you know, unrealistic, eh, something like that. But I think we have enough to actually go and evaluate the answer choices. And so I said blatantness wouldn't be correct and that the glaring nature wouldn't be correct, but they lead us to the correct answer. And here we're not talking about a patent, like the, the kind of patent that one gets for an invention to say, uh, you know, this is the person who came up with this invention and they get the, uh, the rights to profit from it or whatever. Patent in this case does mean like blatant, glaring, something along those lines. So uh, the shortcomings are not overlooked. Um, they exist, they just haven't been addressed. And they're not occasional, it's not a matter of, you know, being that way sometimes and not at other times. It's about the fact that they are very clearly on the surface. And then here, okay, I came up with irrelevant and narrow, but at least we know it needs to be something negative. And the only one of these that really fits, at least in this context, would be improbable. So more proofs of yet more improbable theorems. Okay, I, there's a little bit of process of elimination here because comprehensive and wide range do go together, but it's the others who are embracing this wider range of things that people do. So these theorems, if anything, would be the opposite of comprehensive. And then pervasive, that means wide ranging. You wanna make sure we don't confuse that with perverse, which means sort of weird, strange, backwards. Um, doesn't make sense here. So improbable. Again, this can show, I think, how you don't have to come up with anything uh, too, too precise necessarily. You get yourself thinking in the right direction and it'll be easier to find that answer to pick it out, to pick it out of the lineup, so to speak. Here we've got three blanks. So the question of blank in photography has lately become non-trivial. Okay, so if something is trivial, it's unimportant. If it's non-trivial, it is important. It's relevant. Something like that. Prices for vintage prints, those made by a photographer soon after he or she made the negative, so drastically blank, did something, they did something in the 1990s that one of these photographs might fetch or warrant a uh, fetch... Uh, um, <laughs> attract uh, in monetary terms a hundred times as much money as a non-vintage print of the same image. So that means that these prices have uh, increased. Okay. What kind of question are we talking about? I don't know. Let's see. Um, vintage prints have gone up. I think we need our last sentence to really tell us what's going to go in that blank. So it was perhaps only a matter of time before someone took advantage of the blank to peddle newly created, quote, vintage prints for profit. Okay, so these are not actually vintage if they're newly created. It would be kind of like if you took a photo and then put a filter on it to make it look vintage. And so that means that this would be, you know, something to do with authenticity. Is it the genuine article or not? And then what would someone take advantage of? I think the, the difference, the price difference. Boy, you can't read that. The price difference. So authenticity increased and price difference. Okay, and here's another one where authenticity and forgery certainly don't mean the same thing, but in this context, they both have to do with whether or not something is the genuine article. And so 
it's a question. It's a question of whether it's authentic or whether it's a forgery. So in this case, both of those words have more or less, as far as I'm concerned, the same kind of function, even if they're not going to be words that you find uh, in the thesaurus as synonyms. So we're going to go ahead and say that that's going to be correct. So it's not about influence or style. Not about influence or style. Now here, we need something that means increased, and that's going to be ballooned. So prices can't really weaken. And while they can vary, and they did vary in this case, it's not, I mean, vary doesn't suggest a, a direction. Vary just suggests that it went up or down, or up and down, and up and down again, maybe. Uh, here we need something that means difference, and that's going to be discrepancy. So it's a total coincidence that it happens to be the first one in each of the three uh, blanks. Ambiguity, that means that something isn't really clear. It could be this way. It could be the other way. It's open to interpretation. But in this case, no. It's It might be ambiguous when you look at a given image in terms of a trying to figure out whether it is real or authentic. But in this case, the word here is talking about a price difference. And then duplicity, that means it kind of being two-faced, dupe, dupe. That has to do with two, like a duplex is a house with two units. Duplicity, you're saying one thing to one group of people and one thing to another group of people, or uh, you're not being honest. But that's not relevant here in terms of referring to the price difference. Now here, a very different kind of question, a strengthen weaken question, or in this case, specifically a weaken question. And I've gone this, I've gone over this one in more detail elsewhere on this channel, and I can link to that, but we'll do it here anyway. And what I want to emphasize is that whether you have a strengthen or weaken question, when you are first looking at the actual argument, you want to really look for, well, first of all, follow the line of reasoning and identify the argument, but see if you can identify also some sort of gap, assumption, something that's taken for granted by the anonymous author. And the reason why you want to do that, again, I elaborate on it in the other video, but the idea is if you're trying to weaken an argument, you want to expose or cast doubt on the assumptions that the author is making. If you're trying to strengthen it, you want to sort of shore up or verify those assumptions and show that they are valid. Okay, so even after numerous products made with artificial sweeteners became available, sugar consumption per capita or per person continued to rise. Okay, so they're saying sugar consumption, that's supposed to be an arrow, sugar consumption, oops, that's not our x-axis though, sugar consumption over time, and here we can say maybe uh, at a certain point they introduced products with artificial sweeteners, but it didn't slow the, slow the rise, or at least didn't stop the rise. Now manufacturers are introducing fat-free versions of various foods that they claim have the taste and texture of the traditional high-fat versions. Okay, so even if the manufacturer's claim is true, Given that the availability of sugar-free foods did not reduce sugar consumption, it is unlikely that the availability of these fat-free foods will reduce fat consumption. So I'm going to say that this is really the argument. Although if you wanted, you could say that that whole portion here is the argument. And so why not just go ahead and underline all of that? So given, that, given what took place with sugar, we expect the same thing to happen with fat. And so the assumption here is really that, you know, what, what is true of sugar and sugar-free substitutes is also or will also, I'm just going to say is also true of fats and etc. So sugar and sugar-free substitutes, fat and fat-free substitute. So if we want to weaken it, if we want to weaken the argument, we can uh, 
maybe cast some doubt on this assumption. Because again, they haven't proven that this is true. They're just using this as the basis for the conclusion that they uh, are coming to here. So what if, then, what if, what if there's something fundamentally different about sugar and sugar-free substitutes on the one hand and fat and fat-free substitutes on the other? That is something to keep in mind. So looking at the answer choices, several kinds of fat substitute are available to manufacturers, each of which gives a noticeably different taste and texture to products that contain it. Well, no. I mean, I think this could be read in a couple of ways. Are they different from one another? That's not particularly relevant because we're not comparing different fat substitutes. But if they give a taste and texture that is noticeably different from the taste and texture of the food that they're supposed to be uh, mimicking or, you know, serving as fat-free versions of, that would be a problem. So I think, depending on how we interpret this, it's either irrelevant or it would strengthen the argument. In other words, it would, it would suggest that the fat-free versions are, are really no more authentic-seeming than the sugar-free versions are. Okay, so that's not going to be correct. The products made with artificial sweeteners did not taste like products made with sugar. Okay, that is going to be our correct answer. And the reason is this. Getting back to this idea that if we can show that they made an assumption that doesn't really hold true, that's going to be a way to weaken the argument. And our passage has already said that the manufacturers claim that these foods do have the taste and texture of the traditional high-fat versions. And while that is perhaps subject to question, in this case, our, 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 our author is saying, well, even if that's true, it's unlikely. And in this case, what I would say is, no, that matters. If it is true, that's going to be a difference between the fat-free products and the sugar-free products because the products made with artificial sweeteners, the sugar-free products, did not taste like the products that they were supposed to replace. So that's a difference. It calls into question that fundamental analogy that the argument is based on. So that's going to be our correct answer. But let's look at the others. So it says the foods brought out in sugar-free versions did not generally have reduced levels of fat, but many of the fat-free versions are low in sugar. That's just irrelevant. It's mixing up points that are not relevant to the argument being made. D, people who regularly consume products containing artificial sweeteners are more likely to consume fat-free foods. Again, not relevant. Not relevant to the argument. So we want to keep our eyes on the ball, stay focused on what they're talking about. And then E, not all foods containing fat can be produced in fat-free versions. Well, nowhere in here is anyone claiming that all foods containing fat are going to be produced in fat-free versions. The question has to do with whether, you know, whatever fraction of foods containing fat can be produced in fat-free versions, will those actually succeed in, in terms of taking the place of or cutting down on the consumption of fat? So... It's, that's kind of a mischaracterization of the argument, and we want to be aware of that as a kind of wrong answer that they'll come up with. Select the sentence that provides support for an answer to a question in the passage. Okay, so we'll read the passage and look for a question. Let's just go ahead and do that. So historians frequently employ or use probate inventories or lists of possessions compiled after a person's death to estimate standard of living. So I'm going to say that's background. It's not a question. It's not an answer to a question. I don't think it's support for an answer to a question. Okay. Because these inventories were taken by amateur assessors or people who assess the value of things, according to unwritten rules, they are sometimes unreliable. More background. One way to check their accuracy is to compare them to archaeological records. Okay, and so I'm going to say that's a background point, but it's also a problem. This is a, a possible solution to the problem. 
Uh, that's not necessarily the same thing as an answer to a question. So it says, a study of records from the state of Delaware in the 18th century found that while very few inventories listed earthenware, like pots, uh, every excavation contained earthenware. Okay. I'm going to say that's a finding. Okay. Earthenware may have gone unlisted simply because it was inexpensive. I'm going to say that's speculation or, you know, hypothesis because it's using the word may. But if it was so commonplace, why was it listed more often for wealthy households? Okay, so that's the question. That's the question. But if we look at our question, they're not asking for the sentence that asks a question. And they're not even asking for the sentence that provides an answer to the question. They want something that provides support for an answer. Support for an answer. But they, first of all, I think we need to find the answer. And I think we're going to see that it's right here. Perhaps, maybe, the more earthenware people had, the more likely the appraisers were to note it. Okay, question, answer. A few bowls could easily be absorbed into another category, but a room full of earthenware could not. That's the support. That's the support. So our color coding here. I wish I could highlight more neatly, uh, but it's very hard given the pad that I'm working with, but we have support for an answer to a question. So I'm going to guess, I'm going to say that by far the most common incorrect answer on this one would be the sentence that I have in green. But this is a reminder that we want to make sure to read the question carefully. And that's especially true on the new GRE when there are fewer questions than before. And that means that each question is more heavily weighted than the questions on the previous version. Sentence equivalence. Really here what I emphasize is the same kind of approach that I would emphasize for the text completion questions. And that is to be proactive, think of something that would go in the blank, and then look for the two words that mean, that have the same meaning. If you can't figure that out, I mean, if you can't come up with an approximate answer, then we can talk about some plan B options in terms of working backward from the answer choices. But Again, I call that plan B for a reason. It's not the ideal. So it says here, early critics of Emily Dickinson's poetry mistook for simple-mindedness the surface of artlessness that, in fact, she constructed with such blank. Okay, so the sentence structure here, even though it's just one sentence without any real punctuation, it is kind of complex. So let's read it again. People who criticized her poetry saw this artless surface. So what is an artless surface? Maybe something that's simple. I mean, if, if you think of um, you know, a design, a, a really simple design, it might look artless compared to one that has really intricate engravings and patterns, for example. So they mistook for simple-mindedness that's a negative thing. Simple-mindedness is like a uh, lack of, you know, lack of ideas. Somebody is simple-minded, you know, they're kind of, you know, dumb, you could say, or at least not very mentally sophisticated. So they saw this artless or simple surface and mistook it for simple-mindedness or attributed to her this negative quality, simple-mindedness, when in fact, in other words, when she actually constructed her poems with a lot of care or we could say maybe attention to detail eh, maybe not detail but um, a lot of intention intention you know purposefulness and so I think something in that ballpark okay so astonishment no astonishment is just surprise like more than surprise like shock okay Craft, on the other hand, is a match. Craft, care, attention to detail, intention. 
all of those together point us in that direction. And then the same thing is true of cunning. I mean, cunning may have a slightly negative connotation in certain circumstances, but it basically means that someone is calculating. They are really you know, paying attention. They're not just doing something simple-mindedly. So it, it is the opposite of simple-minded in this context. Innocence and naivety, or naivete, would be synonyms of each other. And those are closer to simple-mindedness, but that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for, for something that's, you know, maybe the opposite of simple-mindedness. And then vexation. Vexation is like confusion or irritation, something like that. And so what we find here with our answer choices is a, you know, it's a fairly common pattern in the sense that we have, we have two pairs. We have our correct pair, we have an incorrect pair, and then we have two individuals. And you're either going to see that or you're going to see three pairs. I mean, it's very rare that you're going to have one pair and then four individual words that aren't related. Another text, excuse me, sentence equivalence question. So the macromolecule, large molecule RNA, is common to all living beings. And DNA, which is found in all organisms except some bacteria, is almost as widespread. Okay, if, if this is, if RNA is common to all living beings and DNA is found in all organisms except for bacteria, so what am I doing with this circle? Maybe, maybe this is bacteria and maybe this is, this, the big circle means all organisms. So if it's common to all living beings, then it really is universal or ubiquitous, but DNA, if it's found in almost all organisms, it's almost as universal or ubiquitous. Again, I'm just going to say ubiquitous is one of those vocabulary words that you, you know, you need to know because you're going to see it. If not on every test, you'll see it frequently enough. It means widespread. Now, comprehensive and inclusive could be viewed as synonyms, but in this case, neither one of them really works because it's not saying that DNA includes all organisms. It's saying that all organisms contain DNA, and that's a little bit different. And then eh, fundamental. Fundamental could mean basic. Um, certainly, if you think of DNA as, a, as um, in terms of genetics, you could say it's a, you know, understanding DNA is fundamental to understanding genetics. But that's not what this sentence is saying here. And then significant, again, I mean, maybe it is significant. And fundamental and significant perhaps could be viewed as synonyms. I guess if I were going to think in terms of pairs here, inclusive and comprehensive meh, kind of go together, fundamental and significant. But here it's all about how common these things are. Extremely common to the point of being ubiquitous or even universal. So that is what we want there. And yet another sentence equivalence question. So while in many ways their personalities could not have been more different, she was ebullient where he was glum, relaxed where he was awkward, garrulous or garrulous where he was blank, they were surprisingly well suited. Okay, so the important thing here is that we have a contrast or a series of contrasts. So what was she ebullient where he was glum? What is the difference there? Well, ebullient is kind of radiant. Uh, um, it's, it's a positive quality. I mean, it's somebody who is ebullient. Um, trying to think of another word that it connects to. Um, you know, full of enthusiasm, full of life. Glum means uh, depressed, seeming, or, or just sour. Uh, unenthusiastic okay relaxed where he was awkward and then garrulous what is garrulous without looking at a dictionary I'm gonna say it means something like talkative or outgoing and so that means that if we're looking for an opposite it would be something like shy shy and now here's a case where we might not know all the words, but you don't need to know all the words if you can find the two that are correct. 
And in this case, our two that are correct are going to be laconic and taciturn. Okay, laconic and taciturn. Laconic means using few words. Uh, if someone makes, uh, if someone gives laconic answers. They're giving maybe one word or two word answers. How was your dinner? It was good. How was the movie? Uh, okay. Yeah, laconic. You're not saying much. And then taciturn and basically means eh, something pretty similar. Taciturn, you're not outgoing. Um, looking at these others, though, um, fastidious means very careful, paying a lot of attention to detail. So uh, maybe, I don't know if it would have worked with the Emily Dickinson question, but you know, if someone is a fastidious housekeeper, they are very neat, very, very neat. Um, solicitous this one is kind of tricky because if you solicit something you you uh, sort of request it or ask for it but solicitous means um sort of concerned for someone else concerned in the sense of like you're, you're caring these are not going to be synonyms certainly not going to be synonyms but if you're solicitous of someone you you look after them you're concerned for their well-being Okay, and then irresolute and munificent. And honestly, honestly, I'm going to consult our friend Merriam-Webster for uh, at least for munificent. With irresolute, what we could say is, well, if you're resolute, that's related to resolve. If you're resolved, you're, you're sort of set in your ways. So irresolute should be the opposite of that. We'll come back to it in a second. But munificent. So very liberal in giving or bestowing characterized by great liberality or generosity so munificent very generous and in that case i think we could say that that is eh, possibly going to be our synonym with solicitous mm, nope never mind never mind expressing solicitude full of concern or fears meticulously careful so perhaps solicitous and fastidious do go together Okay, and then irresolute, uncertain how to act or proceed. Yeah, so this is the opposite of resolute. If you're resolute, if you're resolute, you are resolved. You know how you're going to act. If you're irresolute, you're not sure. So this would be another case where eh, perhaps we could say that we've got a couple, we've got two pairs. We've got our correct pair. We could perhaps say that those are, are synonyms, and then we've got our two our two singletons, munificent and irresolute, that are just individual words that don't have synonyms among the group. And another sentence equivalence question. So even in this business, where blank is part of everyday life, a talent for lying is not something usually found on one's resume. Okay, so... If something is not usually found on one's resume, what does that mean? It means it's not something not something to brag about, not something to be proud of or to advertise in a, in a sense and doesn't mean necessarily buying an official advertisement, but just not you know, you're not going around and saying, "Hey, I'm a really good liar." Um and so Okay, well, how can we use that? Well, it is saying that, you know, a certain kind of... Maybe some dishonesty. Some, you know, maybe white lies in the sense of, you know, little lies here and there. So even in this business, maybe it's... Um, I don't know what business it might be, but some kind of business where a certain kind of deception or something like that is part of everyday life. Even there... People don't go around and brag about being outright dishonest. And so the correct answers here, scanning down, the correct answers are going to be this one and this one. So mendacity and prevarication. So basically to prevaricate is to lie. I mean, we could get more precise. We could get more precise and go back to our friend the dictionary. But to prevaricate is to sort of talk around the truth, to deviate from the truth, to equivocate, yeah, playing fast and loose with the truth. Okay. Avarice is greed. 
insensitivity. I think you know what that means. It means you're not sensitive. Baseness. Baseness is like low morals. Um, base. Lacking or indicating the lack of higher qualities of mind or spirit. Lacking higher values. So something like that. And then aspiration. If you aspire to something, that's good. But aspiration as a quality is more like a, it's striving for like maybe wealth or or status or something like that. So aspiration. Again, you're when we look up aspiration, we're going to see that there is um it's going to as a noun it could mean something like a goal like a, 1a 1a but see that's that's not the same thing as mendacity or prevarication so it's not going to be correct back to reading comprehension so we're going to have three questions based on this passage and given that we are going to have three questions first thing we're going to do is just go ahead and read the passage and not not get distracted by the questions Okay, so we're going to read the whole passage here. And what do we want to do when we read it? I'm going to say our goal is to summarize it in a handful of words, three to five words, what this passage is saying. Three might be tough, but I think it's good to try to summarize it in as few words as possible because that really forces you to, to, uh, to focus on the big picture and not get lost in the details. So... In the 1980s, neuroscientists studying the brain processes underlying our sense of conscious will, okay, so these neuroscientists, they compared subjects' judgments, the judgments of the subjects in the experiment, the people they were studying, they compared their judgments regarding their will to move and their actual movement <laughs> with, what did they compare those things with? Objective electroencephalographic activity. Okay, what on earth is that? We'll come back to it in a second. But uh, objective electroencephalographic activity called readiness potential or RP. Okay, a lot to unpack there. So what did they compare, first of all? They compared, on the one hand, subjects judgments regarding these two things they compared that with objective activity called readiness potential okay and what is electroencephalographic well we could break it down electro I think you know what that means graphic that means you know recording writing down or recording and then encephalo encephalo well, here the portion that I would, would highlight or focus in on would be this part. And that has something to do with the head or brain. Basically, it's a way of measuring brain activity. That's the important thing here. But it, your a success on a passage like this isn't going to turn on your knowledge of a nine-syllable word. I think that's nine syllables. Okay, but anyway, they made this comparison. They compared these things with these things subjective measurements like what people thought they were doing or thought they were thinking with objective and maybe that's the big big distinction to make here subjective objective first person third person you could say um, okay as expected w preceded or came before n the will to move came before the actual movement. And why is that expected? Because if, if you think of like, I'm going to go get a, a drink, and then you get up and get a drink. It would be weird if, if you went and got a drink and then thought, hey, I'm going to go get a drink. Okay, so as expected, W preceded M. And they're going to explain that. Subjects consciously perceived the intention to move or will to move as preceding or coming before a conscious experience of actually moving. So, W and M. This might seem to suggest an appropriate correspondence or relationship between the sequence of subjective experiences and the sequence of the underlying events in the brain. Okay, in other words, it might seem to suggest that people's subjective 
impressions or perceptions of their mental processes actually map on to the underlying reality. But researchers actually found a surprising temporal, temporal relation, and temporal means having to do with time. So they found a surprising temporal relation between subjective experience and objectively measured neural events. In direct contradiction of the classical conception of free will, neural preparation to move preceded conscious awareness of the intention to move by hundreds of milliseconds. So in other words, I don't know why they call it RP, um, I would call it NP, neural preparation, but anyway, um, no, readiness potential. Readiness potential actually preceded that. So this is their finding. The subjective impression that the subjects had was this coming before this. The subjects don't have any way to, to sense readiness potential because that's strictly an objective uh, measurement, not something that someone themselves could could perceive. But we're going to... okay. I'm going to say that's the summary. Here's the finding. Here's what people subjectively think. And I'm going to say it's a surprising finding. It contradicts the classical or long-held uh, conception of free will. Okay. So based on information contained in the passage, which of the following chains of events would most closely conform to the classical conception of free will? Okay, so here we have to use what they give us in this last sentence to infer something about the classical conception. So if, if it's in direct contradiction to the classical conception of free will, I'm going to use a different color, if it's in contradiction, if it goes against the classical perception of free will for RP to precede W, then the classical conception of free will probably thinks that W precedes RP. Now, what about M? I don't think the classical conception of free will would have M coming before either one of these steps. So I think we want M to be on the, the right. And I think we can go ahead and eliminate anything that doesn't have M on the right. which would mean B, C, and D, excuse me, C, D, and E. What about A and D? Well, W followed by R, P followed by M. So this is going to be the classical conception, whereas this would be the new finding, the surprising finding. So a lot going on here, but I think this is a good example of why we want to make sure we're reading and understanding the passage because you really have to read between the lines to get this one. They're not coming right out and telling you. At least not explicitly. In the context in which it appears, temporal most nearly means something like sequential or chronological. So have, having to do with the sequence of events. So secular, what does secular mean? I mean, a secular is like the opposite of... Uh, hmm... Yeah, secular. If someone is involved in the church or religious matters, those are those are not secular. Okay, and so we see what they've done here. It does have a relationship to the word temporal, but with these questions, that doesn't matter. It matters how it's being used in this sentence. Yeah, I was thinking of it in this sense, not overtly or specifically religious. Okay, so if it's not religious, if it's not related to the otherworldly, it is related to worldly, everyday types of concerns. Just not relevant here. So mundane is being used in quite a similar, you know, mundane means basically worldly. And there is a, there is a root there. Like in, I know in French, the word for world is monde and I think in Spanish it's mundo something like that so there is a relationship there so it's down to earth it's not up in the up in the stars up in the sky up in the heavens numerical 
Well, that's not quite getting at what we want here. Again, it has to do with the sequence, what comes before the other. So even though it is, in a sense, physiological, that's not what this word is pointing to. And again, it's not numerical, it's which came before the other. And then finally here, we have a little question about the purpose. If we think about the context of the passage, I mean the purpose of an element within the passage. So if we think about the context of the passage as a whole, well, we have this surprising new finding. And then we have the sort of backdrop against which this surprising finding is surprising. In other words, why is it surprising? It's surprising because it contradicts the classical conception. So in other words, mentioning the classical conception helps to clarify why this finding is surprising. Okay, the reason that the results of the study were surprising. Again, they were surprising because they contradicted the classical conception. So, they're not arguing. They're not arguing anything here, really. They're reporting on what somebody else found. So I think you can get rid of A really based on that first word. Suggest, well, they're not suggesting any flaws in anyone's reasoning here um, at all. They're just showing that this, reporting that this new evidence contradicted this old way of thinking. Provide a possible explanation for the unexpected results? No. That might be tempting, but, but, even though the word unexpected results or the words unexpected results might, you know, seem to connect, they're not explaining anything. They're not explaining anything other than <laughs> giving a reason why the results were surprising. But they're not saying why those results came about. They're not saying why it is that this precedes conscious awareness, you know, in terms of describing some kind of mental neural mechanism or something like that and they're not casting doubt I don't think we see anything that that cast doubt you know on their conclusion so they're indicating the reason why the results were surprising and so that'll do it for this section I will record section two separately and link to that below and then also do the math but once I get all of those done, you'll be able to see all the links below for this test, uh, Power Prep 1.